It's World of Dance finale day, and I've tried really hard to get this guy to tell me who wins. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. Welcome to another episode of To The Point with Kristen Burt, presented by Popcorn Talk and, of course, Dance Network. And it is World of Dance finale day. We don't know who wins. I've tried to find out who wins and he won't tell me. But we have in studio today none other than the president of World of Dance and one of the executive producers on the NBC show, David Gonzalez. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, this is exciting. I know, well, I've gotta say that um, I tried off camera to get you to say who it was and you were like, nope. <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna happen. You're gonna have to view tonight, you know, every rating counts, so hopefully everyone <laughs> tunes in. I will be tuning in for sure, I promise you that. And uh, But as I said, a lot of people kept their mouth shut on this particular show and other shows that doesn't happen so I was like kudos to you guys <laughs> it's, it's the stronghold contract yes we even think that the audience you watch the taping back in February like they had the life scared out of them with that contract <laughs> they're probably like I can't say anything <laughs> yeah. well I, I can't what I can say is that it's gonna be a great finale um, I, one, one thing that I did want to add is it's interesting because in the beginning of the show, the idea that the juniors competing with the teams, competing with the uppers, you know, it was questionable in the beginning. What I can say in the end, especially as it unfolds to a finale, is that really anyone can be competing against anyone and it's about the moment in time that you're on that stage and you deliver the best show you can in that moment and how the judges see it is how the judges see it. Um, but it's definitely gonna be exciting tonight. Which means that we'll have a lot of conversation about it later. That's what I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm still, we're still talking about last week, which we'll get to. Um, but I really want to clear some things up for people because I think when this show came around, for a lot of people, they just saw, oh, it's another dance competition show. Um, but what a lot of people don't understand, and I've been doing a lot of articles, I've been out there at the tour and the competitions and things, people are like, oh, wait, there's a tour? And so in their mind, they think a tour is just like Dancing with the Stars tour where they go theater to theater. This is a whole brand, um, and it's a whole movement, and until you go and visit, I don't think people grasp at how big it is and how impactful it is. Um, and it's, such, it's so much fun to watch and see just everyone participating, all walks of life, every age, every background. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah well, I, I don't know. I mean, we started this journey in 2008, um, and it was a single event. At the time we were producing World of Dance, the idea was that we were going to take these unique uh, audiences. So in the urban field, first of all, we don't call World of Dance a hip hop competition. Mm -hmm. We call it an urban dance competition. And we took fields like break dancing or crumping or choreography. And at one given time, the dance competitions used to identify themselves by the genre. So for instance, you know, tap or ballet or jazz was a specific genre. What we saw was a vision where the urban styles of music was driving the competition. And although people could break dance or choreography or crump or whatever style it is that they had, um, our vision was to bring it all together under one roof. We threw our first show in 2008. Uh, it was actually in the Pomona Fairplex. You, you had actually gone to the I Pomona was Fairplex there. this year. <laughs> yep. Um, and it was an amazing success. A lot of people at the time said, oh, bringing these communities together wasn't going to work. But we didn't know otherwise. And being that I'm not a core dancer, I said, hey, I, th I think this will work. and. We were lucky enough to put it together and it worked out really well. Well, I always start off to the point asking people like, what's your dance training? Literally, tell us what your dance training is. My dance training probably came in after watching a couple of the first uh, break-in movies. Um, <laughs> but I will not say by any means that I am a dancer. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, defame the art form that much. Uh, what I will say is that um, I've always appreciated dance. I've always liked dance. I've always liked lifestyles. And I've always liked helping lifestyles flourish. So to me, dance felt like something that I could contribute to. That's you said something, um, and I actually communicated with uh, Deidre Newman from, she was the OC Business Journal, uh, kind of at the beginning of the season. She was like, just read this article um, about you and Matt Everett, who is obviously a CEO of uh, World of Dance. And one thing that stood out to me, and it's something that I talk about all the time, you wrote, dance did not have a strong media space. And it's true. It's even true in 2017, even with amazing um, TV shows like World of Dance and Dance with the Stars and So You Think and America's Best Dance Crew, um, we see dancers not understanding how to embrace media or how to encourage media sometimes. Um, 
even for me as a journalist, I th the dancers that I see succeeding understand how to embrace media and get press and use it to their advantage. And then there's others that I would love to interview. They don't even return emails um, or they don't check their messages and things like that. So I was like, this you were like kind of the right person to sort of come into this space because there's a separation sometimes between dance and business and the two of them really need to come together. And I know your background um, coming off of Hot Import Nights, which if you're not familiar with this, it's kind of, it's an amazing, it's an amazing it, event that's gone on for years. It's in the automotive industry, of course. It, it still goes on to this day. The, yeah. the interesting thing about the car show world is, in a sense, the business model of the car show is very similar to the business model of a dance competition. Go figure. That's the car guys are actually displaying their artistry. It's just through mechanics of mm -hmm. how they install a car. But you're either a car crew or a car guy. And in essence, you're paying to participate in a competition hoping to win. Um, dance is very similar in the sense that the artistry is through motion and uh, dance. And it's, you're either a, a dance guy or gal or you're in a crew um, of some sort and you're competing on a stage and hoping to win. Um, I think that the spirit of the car show and the spirit of the dance um, at least from World of Dance's perspective, is interesting because, yes, someone wins, but it's not really about winning. It's more about participating and displaying your artistry. I think that sometimes the idea that it's a World of Dance competition is like, oh my god, it's all about competition and someone's going to win. Of course, in any competition, there is a winner. But I think more so than anything, it's about participating and it's about sharing and it's about taking your artistry and putting it out there to the world so that more people can see it. Yeah, and I think that that's a re really big idea that more people need to embrace. I come out of the automotive industry, believe it or not. I hosted a show for Toyota for five years. Wow. Yeah, so I'm like, I kind of understand what you're saying because um, I travel to a lot of the auto shows, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so after you do this in 2008, when you do this one-off dance event and it's a huge success, did you think, holy cow, we need to do more of these? Like, how do we become more of part of the community? How do we get the word out? Yeah, um, I think that's a, that's an interesting uh, point in time because the vision for World of Dance was, although it starts with a single event, it was called World of Dance Tour from day one, even in its single event form. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that we would have a tour that we now have today. Um, the idea of a tour in itself, how do you scale that? Um, and that's where we started doing licensing models and actually having a global presence. Mm -hmm. um, I think the important thing to kind of look at in media is that the more impressions you're generating for yourself, the more likely people are learning about what you're doing. And that, that's the same for business as it is for the dancer. The more impressions they can get, good or bad, the more people are aware of what you're doing. Um, that was the idea of scaling the tour. You have to have more events to be able to have more content, to be able to have more viewership, to be able to have more audience. And all of the things are symbiotic. The, the dancer, uh, needs the platform to display themselves, but the audience needs the, the dancer's creativity to appreciate something. And, and we need both an audience and the dancer and the business to come together to make this all work as, as one big community. And, and make it profitable. And I think that's one of the things that as artists, uh, a lot of people get stuck on is how do you make dance profitable? And uh, you've been able to sort of like pull some components together and create a whole brand around this. You know, I, I think one of the things that I can share is that a lot of times as the business, people can point at any big business, uh, it doesn't matter what brand it is, and say, oh, they must be doing something right. They're a bigger business. Um, we are still a very small business. We've been very fortunate to build a brand in an authentic way, uh, which led to the NBC partnership and so forth. But I think that what people, and especially the dance community, needs to know about World of Dance is that we are working with you and amongst you. So your economy is our economy mm -hmm. to a certain extent. A lot of times people don't understand that. They assume that, hey, you know, I'm paying $40 as a registration fee or $25 even. I actually, now that I think about it, our competition fees are $25. That's really um, low for some of the competition it's circuit. really low. Yep. And, and here's another thing to consider, that in the competition world, there are thousands of dance competitions most of those competitions were focused on a younger audience where mom and dad are literally the, the sort of uh, financiers of their son or daughter's competition. We focus on pretty much the 15 to 25 year old. Um, a lot of times these are the kids that are, you know, high school uh, or, or early college. They're the people that are trying to establish a career in dance. They're the people that may or may not even have a job and are just breaking off parental support. So we are building our business in a model of people 
that is struggling just like we're struggling. And I think the key is how do you continue to build? How do you continue to get better? How do you continue to evolve? And how do you bring everyone with you? I think that's a very important aspect. It's not just about World of Dance. When I view World of Dance, I, I, I can selfishly look at it as a brand, like this is something that I'm operating. But I also say that there's people that dance in the dance community, and then there's people that World of Dance within our community. They're right. sort of the ones that are really engulfed in our community. And what I would like to see happen in our community um, is lots and lots of opportunity evolve, more jobs, more people, more branded campaigns, more competition, more prize money, more, 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 because to a certain extent, that's what the community needs. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's even why the, the TV show is successful. You're like, holy cow, it's a million dollar prize. Yeah. I, we haven't seen anything like that ever in the dance community. So, you know. That's understandable why everyone's been so competitive on the show. But you have a lot of homegrown superstars um, that have come out of World of Dance. And I know we talked about it when you were in Pomona. But and, and this has been kind of an interesting thing because they've been probably the most talked about duo. But Lay Twins really are kind of one of the biggest success stories that have come out of your whole tour. It's incredible. Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of a funny story about the Lay Twins. Um, there was a dance channel, YouTube channel, called Yak Films. Um, they were known for filming uh, sort of the urban choreography, urban, not, not, not really choreography, I'd, I'd probably say they focus more on the urban style dancers um, all around the world. They, they do a great job at capturing film. And uh, one of the videographers, at the time, we didn't even have a budget to film our own events. Mm -hmm. He had offered to film our event for free and basically said, in exchange for filming your event, do you mind if you invite a couple of my friends to your show? And I'm like, who are your friends? He's like, here's a video link of them. They're really great. You know, they're nice guys. Laurent and Larry. We, we, we did not know who they were at the time. And quite frankly, I don't think anyone in the United States really knew who they were at that given time. Um, the do you remember what year it was? It was the San Diego event. And I probably want to suggest 2009 or 10 okay. maybe. Yeah. Um, so what was interesting is we brought them in to our San Diego event, featured them as a talent, and what they did was just one of those moments where you say, I've never seen that before. It mm -hmm. was unique. And they, they actually coined their style in a sense, new style. Um, and that's really what it was from everyone that viewed it. It was like, what is this style? This is new, this is different, I haven't seen it. That video to this day has hundreds of millions of views and is one of the reasons why they even got picked up to get on the Beyonce tour and you know of course. Ma many of their other uh, career attributes so that's kind of incredible um, you know and I think what what is amazing about World of Dance 2 is that you really embrace YouTube very early I mean even though YouTube at that point had probably been around three four years but the fact that dance really started to incorporate um, and become a place where people can discover you, t you know, dance talents and things like that. I I've, I've been to your events. I see you guys out there. You've got four or five, six videographers like running around the stage, capturing every angle. It and they're up pretty quickly on your channel because I'm always looking. I'm like, I want to see that one again. I want to see that one again. So, what really made you sort of embrace the whole YouTube culture? You know, what's interesting is um, I, I'll share with you after the interview a picture. Maybe you could put it on your blog. Mm -hmm. But there's a picture that we have from our first event when the Jabberwockies had just won America's Best Dance Crew and performed at World of Dance as our first event. And what I saw in that picture wasn't the fact that the, the, the picture was from the perspective of the audience, not the performance. What I saw was everyone in the audience holding up their camera, filming that performance. It was in that moment of the very first show, seeing the audience, this millennial group, capturing the content that I knew that that's naturally what the audience does. Yeah. Um, and really, from that moment forward, we made sure that media was the connection to help make the World of Dance brand what it is today. At first, we were thinking that the media was going to be connecting with some of the existing uh, media platforms that existed. So we were making rounds, talking with some of the magazines, some of the print publications, some of the people that were already in dance media. Mm -hmm. um, but what we had noticed is a lot of those people were also in dance media, but from maybe a print perspective. Um, and dance needs to be captured, it needs to be in motion, you need to see the emotion, you can capture it in a, a picture, but there's something different about capturing it in video. 
and that's when YouTube started to evolve and more and more people using it. So that, that's where that marriage came from. That's kind of incredible. Because your videos will go up and within sometimes 24 hours, they've got hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of views, depending on who it is, yeah. um, pretty immediately. I mean, you guys have over a million subscribers, I think. Yeah, right now we're about uh, five million subscribers across platform, yeah. maybe two and a half on YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah, our content generally probably does about 30 million monthly views, so there is a pretty significant social presence. Um, I, I, I do believe, though, that it's not still, even though I can say our channel has this many subscribers and that video has that many views, the reality is none of that would exist without the talent. And, 100%. And we, we very much value the talent because we view ourselves as a platform for them to participate either on stage, but it extends beyond the stage through our media connections, whether it's our owned and operated social channels, or now, you know, a licensed NBC show. So, you know, I know that uh, you operate all of the U.S. Um, we operate tour, and then you license it out overseas. Is that correct? That is correct. We started actually producing our events overseas. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was our first iteration of doing tours in London. Um, you know, one tip for entrepreneurs that I could tell people is don't be afraid of failure because we had failed uh, on our first event in London and we bounced back and now we have successful tours throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. um, people always are afraid of failure. I, I'm more along the lines of if you're going to fail, fail fast and make sure you learn from the failure. Um, that's pretty much been our mantra as a business. We've done a lot of things, some of which have worked, some of which haven't, but you know, hopefully we continue to do a lot more things and <laughs> hopefully a lot more of those things work. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you, you have seen a lot of your homegrown babies. We've talked about Lee Twins, but Megan Batoon has been another person oh, that's yeah. come out of the world of dance um, culture and really has made an impact. The fact that I don't know if she's even known now as a dancer per se, as more of a YouTube personality. Absolutely. You know, it, it's interesting because uh, my knowledge of connecting with Megan Batoon was she was at one of our Florida events um, and through that event contacted one of our videographers and just said, hey, I'm, I'm kind of moving to California and don't know too many people. And it was an organic kind of relationship. Well, you know us, so maybe we can do something together. Um, we came up with a program called World of Dance Weekly, which at the time was just sort of a new snippet program. Um, it's funny because if you look at the first few World of Dance weeklies, we never released them. That's some golden content right there. But we didn't release <laughs> them because they were actually too straightforward in a sense of trying to report the news. Mm -hmm. And we felt that the audience, it just felt off in that moment. And what was interesting is every time we would cut the camera, Megan would do this. Megan, she would do something crazy, which is along her personality, not crazy, but just her personality would shine when the camera turned off. And what we started realizing was that's the show. Yes. It's not what we're trying to create. It's her and her expression. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the idea of her being successful has nothing to do with the world of dance. It has to do with the fact that she had an artistry. She had a drive. She wanted to become this star that she is today. Mm -hmm. And she utilized us as part of that platform and process. And we're grateful for her involvement. And hopefully she's grateful for you know our involvement. Right. And at the end of the day, it was a partnership that was win-win. That worked really, really well. That's amazing. Now, when did the whole um, idea for the show come up? And I, I kind of know some of this answer because we've talked about it before. But it's interesting because it came in pieces. It wasn't just like J-Lo shows up at NBC and is like, hey, I know this world of dance thing. It came in, in different pieces and then it was sort of married together. Yeah. The, um, we've been pursuing television relationships for five years. So it's not this is not a process that happened overnight. You're not an overnight success. Is that yeah, what you're telling us? Yeah, it's hard. Pretty much it's hard. <laughs> um, you get a lot more no's than you get yeses. Yep. Um, however, when you do get a lukewarm, mediocre yes, you kind of have to run with that. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably a year ago, um, actually about a year and a half ago, April, um, not this year, so what are we, 2017, 16. 16, yeah. Uh, April 2016 was probably when it started, and that's when we received an inbound email from some development partners at the NBC Alternative Studio mm -hmm. saying we have interest in creating a dance project, and we just heard that you guys produce an event. So really it started from them coming out and surveying what World of Dance currently was. Mm -hmm. um, probably the conversation went a little bit dry for maybe three or four months, because there's a lot of planning taking place on their side and so forth. And then it circled back around with, we think that there's something, you know, can we develop with you? 
you know, what are we trying to develop? And initially we were developing a program that was not to be called World of Dance. It was just World of Dance was helping develop a dance project. But I think as the conversations evolved, it started to make more and more sense to just create one brand, World of Dance. Um, and that's where we're at today. And then when did Jennifer Lopez and her manager, Benny Medina, come aboard? Uh, well, that, that's an interesting conversation because uh, Jennifer and Benny had a pre-existing deal on a scripted um, show, uh, the Shades of Blue show that's already on NBC. Um, and my understanding is that she has a relationship for scripted and sort of a first pass for uh, some non-scripted opportunities. And NBC had probably approached her with many non-scripted opportunities, but at the end of the day, they have to resonate with her. And my feelings is that you know, we can't forget that Jennifer started as a dancer. It's very on brand for her, actually. Yeah. yeah. A, a lot of people will say like, oh, you know, you know, she's a superstar and she doesn't know dance. But, you know, before a superstar. She's an original flag were, girl, people. <laughs> yes. You know, just in the grind like everybody else. Yeah. So I, I would say she knows the dance community as well as any of the current people, um, whoever these, you know, influencers and tastemakers are. But the idea was was really that she had a scripted sort of agreement with a first pass for a non-scripted show. There were, from my knowledge, many non-scripted shows that were pitched, but then came World of Dance, um, and that just resonated with her. Yeah, and I thought, you know, I know when they originally announced it, saying, you know, she's going to help produce it and everything, and then I was like, when are they going to put her on the judging panel? Because, listen, she's already done American Idol. She understands from that perspective, and she was a dancer. So I think – still is a dancer. What am I talking about? In her Vegas show, she dances all the time. Um, but so I, I was like, I'm hoping that they, they throw her on the panel. And I think about a month later, six weeks later, they're like, she's on the panel. And I was like, all right, game on. Because here, here's the thing, and, and I've talked a lot about this. I've covered – the dance competition space, the space was ripe for someone to come in and do something fresh. Um, you know, Dancing with the Stars, we're now moving into season 25. It It's one of those things that, you know, things feel a little bit tired sometimes. So you think is on season 14. You know, America's Best Dance Crew has been in and out. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys kind of came in here and shook things up that I really think that you've put everyone else on notice because so you think has upped their social media game this season brand new set everything else um, i'm looking forward to seeing what dancing with the stars does on season 25 like other people are paying attention to what you guys are doing well first of all thank you for that statement i'm sure everybody that works on the world of dance project is really appreciative that you're noticing these things um what i can say about world of dance is that's different, at least from the television shows that I've seen, is we're not getting too involved in the creative artistry of the dancers. We're letting the dancers represent themselves. Mm -hmm. We're letting them build their brand. We're letting them display themselves as they see fit. Um, in the moment, you know, a judge is going to pick whether that performance was stellar or not, or, or you know, that 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 part of it is is a fact. You know, someone has to judge this. But I think one thing that's very different about World of Dance is that. We're not defining the styles that they have to do. Mm -hmm. we're, we're really saying, you know, if you got the swag and you're good at what you do in your perspective field, then bring it. And if you're really good, you just might have a chance at winning a million dollars here. Which is kind of unbelievable. Uh, I would love to know, sort of in, in the whole process, I've talked to so many different dancers. You know, some people came in through callbacks and things like that, and some people were invited. And But you had this whole um, pool of talent did you guys have ideas like we definitely want to talk to you know Lay Twins see if they're interested? I know Ian Eastwood's done a lot for you guys, yep. Kinjas, Jabberwockies, all of these people. Uh, were you helping suggest talent uh, to the producers? Yes, and, and still are for season two. Um, McNulty casting, they're they're very well known within the dance community. They've cast many shows. Um, they obviously have a pulse uh, on who's who. Um, that's not to say that we don't have relationships through our existing core tour for eight years that we've been having, you know, people judge or participate or perform. So I think that that, in a sense, was another part of the magic of the show. We were really able to nail it in terms of getting the who's who involved in this show. Um, and the outcome of season one was beyond belief. Well, it is ridiculous when the, t <laughs> the cast list was released. I'm like, what? Like, I didn't realize. I knew some people were participating. Um, and then I was like, oh, I didn't know they were involved. They were involved. They were involved. I mean, this was, and I was like, and people are like, but they're established. And I'm like, you're not listening. Their tagline is the Olympics of dance. You don't have a bunch of, it's fun to have some unknowns, but at the same time, 
if I go to the Olympics, you're going to have Simone Biles along with the, you know, someone from the Israeli team that probably is not going to get noticed, but they're all that good that they're at the Olympics. Yep. And yeah. I think that's what people are forgetting sometimes with that. I, I would add on to that, that in the Olympics, you may not win the gold medal in year one, and you might have to come back in year two to seize that medal. And that's also part of the story of World of Dance. We haven't gotten to a season two, but we're welcoming back anybody that participated in season one, uh, partially because they are amongst the best in the world and they should be competing on the World of Dance stage, partially because they're just great entertainers, and partially because it's the world of dance. Well, well, that brings up a good question because I have talked to to people and they're like, yes, you know, people have asked me if I'm interested in, in coming back for season two. Um, do you have ideas of how you're going to incorporate familiar contestants from season one with new contestants? Because that's, you know, there, there's a loyalty fan base already there. You're trying to bring new people in. There's probably people that are also familiar that you're bringing into season two people that might have passed on season one, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I do want to be part of this show. Have you talked about how you're going to piece all of that together? Yeah, right now, it's still in the piece together mm -hmm. mode. Um, so we have seen some really great new submissions, so I can guarantee you it will not be the same as mm -hmm. this year. Um, I also think that we can't forget that the dancers that competed this year, the finale is tonight, so the season hasn't ended. It'll end tonight. And, for a and lot who of wins? <laughs> <laughs> I just had to throw it in there. Sorry. Yeah. I, <laughs> He's I, like, shut up. <laughs> I think I think the thing that I was gonna say was that um, for a lot of people, you know, they may have been eliminated within the last two or three weeks. Although this was pre-taped and took place, um, you know, several months back, the feeling of being eliminated is new over the last couple of weeks. So I think that a lot of people have to digest what happened and if it's right for them to continue on the program or not. Some people will say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna do it because, you know, whatever their reason is. Others are gonna say, you know what? This is national television. I'm building myself, I'm building my brand. And they have to measure at the end of the day if participating in the show is gonna help drive their career. Because I think that there's more than just the contest side of it and walking away with the prize. There's that media angle that we were discussing, you know, getting that TV time and keep in mind, we're not telling them how to dance. You're building yourself, your brand, your personality. It's just through our platform. Okay, this leads to so many questions. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start on this um, because I've, I've talked to some of the contestants and some walk away and go, I get it. They have to produce a TV show, um, but there is a little bit and and. Uh, I'm not criticizing because I, I do understand there's there's two components here. There's the artistry and there's good television and what you have to produce. And some, you know, I talked to Super Crew and Super Crew had a had a tough time in that um, they felt like when they watched the the cut um, that the comments were different than what they had heard live. Yeah. Um, that maybe the judges had retaped some of the criticism to match what their scores were. Um, so when you have things like that, how do you reassure dancers? That's a good question. Yeah, because you know, <laughs> they're nervous. Yeah, my, my, uh, my rebuttal to that, and, and I don't know fact whether things were changed or not. I don't have facts either. I, I, you know, people are like, I have changed scores. I've got facts that no one's presented me with it. I've only, it's only hearsay or anything else like that. So until someone presents me with the tape or the photos, I'm just telling you what yeah, I was told. Yeah, no, and, and I, I, I would appreciate that. I think that my comment on that is I find it hard to believe that the judges are taking bits and pieces and building stories. Uh, at the end of the day, whatever story is being built is still relayed to the score that they received. Mm -hmm. They're not fabricating scores. They're not changing what people actually scored in that moment. Um, what I can tell you, being at the live tapings, and I'm sure you were at a few of the live tapings. I was not allowed by NBC. Oh, well. <laughs> NBC well, knows. <laughs> what, what I can tell you on the live taping side is that the judge's deliberation in terms of the amount of comments that are said, um, there's a process on television where they have to over talk to a certain extent to make sure that the right sound bites and whatnot are pulled mm -hmm. in and that they can actually tell a story. Um, I would wonder if because after every performance, you may see 30 to 45 seconds of sort of judges' deliberation on the TV side. What you're not seeing on the production side is that that process was probably 15 to 20 minutes of deliberation, not back and forth, but 
comments, comments, and comments, and it would not behoove me, now I'm not suggesting that anyone is saying right or wrong or, or anything, but it would not behoove me if what you heard in a 40 minute segment or 15 minute segment was either the good parts and maybe not the bad parts or the bad parts and not the good parts because it's 15 minutes directly after a performance where there's a lot of emotion going on adrenaline adrenaline and you know i, I kind of liken this if anyone's ever experienced where they've witnessed something whether it's a um, an accident or and then someone asks you to recount what you just saw your brain oftentimes sees and hears different things. I, I just know this because I was a witness in a trial once and what I saw and like what came out and what you remember, it's... You know, it, it, this is a funny thing. Um, I, have, <laughs> I have an 11 year old uh, stepson and he watches a program called Mind Games. Um, it's a sort of a Netflix documentary. And they have an interview where a sheriff basically, there's a car that's driving 20 miles an hour and it hits another car and creates a dent. And the sheriff says, how fast was the car going that smashed into the other car? And the guy says, 40 miles around. He said, how far, how fast was the car going that bumped the other car? And how fast was the car going that, uh, you know, that gently tapped the other car? And just the wording creates a perspective in your mind, whether it was 80 miles an hour or five miles an hour. Right. And the reality is perspective is reality. So I'm not going to take that away from anyone's perspective. Mm -hmm. Perspective is reality. So if this is how it was perceived by an individual, then that is true to that individual but we're not in the business of fabricating the entire story. You mm -hmm. know, the judges are, in essence, judging a score, and they're taking that moment and trying to read that moment and do the best they can at saying, you know, was this the best performance I saw out of this particular group? There, there's been a lot of hot topics when it comes to the judges. Some people feel like Lee Twins has been pushed, because uh, they're probably the, the most well-known group other than Jabberwockies can just probably hovering right underneath there. But a lot of people were like, Keone and Mari, I can't believe that they didn't win. They were the real winners. Um, because people really connected with them. They're incredible. I love Keone and Mari. I think they are amazing. Um, it, it's funny because you said it yourself. People are saying, oh, well, you know, the twins might be getting favoritism pushes. But if that were the case, then where is Jabberwockies in the conversation? You know, it, it, And I'll, I'll toss in Ian Eastwood because I'm like, I felt like he got a raw end of the deal sometimes because I was like, nobody understands his style. <laughs> and, and I think that that's what's called good entertainment because Ian is a top-notch dancer and what he does is unique to him and his brand. Um, I think what he did, I think what the Kinjas did in terms of how they represented themselves, honestly, I'm so proud of all of those guys because they represented themselves their way on our platform. And honestly, whether they win or not, they've helped establish their brand and they've helped establish a greater audience. And to me, that's what the partnership's all yeah. about. I'm going to throw the lab in there too because I think that the lab could have been there in the junior division. I'm not shaking but, my head like, no. no, I'm shaking my head like, yes. you bet. Yeah, yes. the, the lab is another one of those amazing groups. You know, it, actually all of the talent was exceptionally great. Uh, you know, I think the, the lab was amazing. Eva's amazing. Diana's been amazing. Nick's been amazing. Jalen and Luca's been amazing. You know, if there's one thing that I would say that the television show has helped in terms of the core world of dance, mm -hmm. we were formerly a little bit more urban. Um, the television show has opened some doors to allow other styles to participate. And those styles, at first I was a little hesitant, like, you know, are, are these going to be perceived well? Um, but now that it's all taking place, I, I can't be more proud of, of how it's all evolved. It's going to help us evolve. Yeah, and it's interesting to, to go now and, you know, yes, there, there's crews and everything else, but DNA is there. And yeah, Eva Igo, I know, is going to be doing the upcoming tour. You've had uh, Luca and Jenna Lynn, of course, in the mix. So, so you are incorporating a lot of things and the audience does respond very well to those. It's not like, no, we're just waiting for the crews to come back out they're responding to these different styles yeah. very enthusiastically. And I think that that's one of the key things that has made us continually successful is that we continue to evolve. Um, you know, the talent that we've had in the past may have come off the back of another television show, or maybe it was, you know, an internet sensation and there was a moment where we're bringing in a lot more of the internet stars. Now we just have an opportunity where the NBC show is developing a new layer of talent and we're able to bring those people in. And again, I think our motive, whether we were urban or whether we're mixed styles, our, our motive as, as World of Dance was we provide the stage, we can help provide an audience, you provide the artistry, 
And now that there's more uh, styles of people participating, that artistry is just being push pushed out there and fans are being built and it's helping build our brand. And, and just so to kind of clarify for people, there's World of Dance, the TV show. There's World of Dance tour, which is the competition. Yep. And then World of Dance Live, which is a sort of a performance aspect, correct? Yes. Um, the World of Dance Live is, in essence, a showcase performance. Um, I wouldn't coin it as a theatrical show yet. Mm -hmm. So in, in a, a typical um, So You Think You Could Dance broadcast show, they might create a theatrical version you know, of So You Think You Could Dance Live. Um, our WOD Live, W-O-D Live, is not a theatrical version of television show. Are, it's basically a showcase of the best of the best, no competition. Mm -hmm. and we've been producing those for five years now. They've all been successful. Matter of fact, we always do one every year at the Universal City Walk. And I've been uh, there. thousands of people come out to this. I went, um, it was actually on Tony Sunday. So the Tony, I went to a Tony's party and then, Jade knows, I showed up uh, all dressed up and uh, went to um, World of Dance Live at Universal City. And I was like, holy cow. I think that was the first thing I said to her. I'm like, there are thousands of people here. I mean, it was jam packed. And yeah. I was like, you're seeing the impact of the show and of, of the whole culture of it. It's really incredible. You know, what's interesting is the very first show that we actually launched at the Universal City Walk, um, that was five years ago, and Universal City Walk had reported to us that that was the largest event in the history of Universal City Walk minus New Year's Eve. So it just gives you a sense of how long this sort of lifestyle movement has been bubbling up. Mm -hmm. And granted that there's television and new acts and new styles and great things happening, this culture's been here for a while, and it's, it's time for it to get to the next level. And it is getting to the next level. And th this is where I have other questions because I, I said to you, we are in this tremendous growth period. We've had La La Land, you know, that's showing up at the Oscars. We see World of Dance coming. We are seeing so much happening on so many different levels. And there's great things coming, um, but I feel like there's been some growing pains. And with World of Dance, we didn't get enough time with you guys this summer. Ten weeks, one hour. I was like, NBC, you need to give us two hours. Are, will we see some of that? Because I'm hearing chatter um, just around the dance community that possibly two hours, maybe um, a longer season. Yeah. What can you tease us with? Uh, I can tell you that there will be more time for sure. Um, in season one, there was uh, about 45 to 50 acts. I don't, I don't, not the, I don't know the confirmed number. But trying to squeeze that in to Thank you. 10 episodes... Um, the reality is some people entered the contest with hopes of more airtime and maybe were not delivered that. That's also a reality of reality television. Mm -hmm. Not everything makes the cut. Um, I, I will say, though, that in season two, there will be more airtime. There will be some more storytelling. And more importantly, there will be some more dance. Um, I think that, that what we did in season one was try to cut as much as we can, knowing that there was only 10 episodes to work with. Uh, right now, they're going through a reformatting phase. Um, I guess one piece of information that I could provide to you, uh, which is maybe an exclusive, because I don't dun, dun, believe, to I the don't point believe exclusive. anyone knows. Get ready. Uh, one thing that I can say is that this year we had juniors, we had upper, and we had team. Um, what we're changing for next year, at least what's in discussion to change, is that there will be junior, junior team, mm -hmm. upper, and upper team. So there will actually be four divisions versus like three. Um, so that, that's something that's exclusive to this. Dun, dun, I love it. No, that makes a lot of sense too. And I think we did have a lot of discussion again, again, Diana, Eva and the lab, you could easily have sent all three of them to the finals with no questions. So Absolutely. yeah, that was one, that was one. And I'm like, we'll, we'll keep talking about that. How about, and this has been an, another debate and I had um, one of the other executive producers slide into my DM. So they didn't do it publicly. So I don't want to like out their names, but, um, you know, I was asking on Twitter, I said, why can't we see all the performances that didn't make the show? Why aren't they up on NBC's YouTube page? Do you know why? Because the, the producer was like, oh, they're up there. And I'm like, no, I'm missing all six of these. Mm. Like, we're missing all of these performances. And I, I would imagine, and don't quote me on this, but mm -hmm. it's probably a music rights That's issue. What I thought. <laughs> um, because in broadcast, it doesn't work the same way as YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the dancers think, oh, you know, YouTube, why can't it go? I put my videos on YouTube and content ID and such and such. It doesn't quite work that way when you're as big a company as Universal, Comcast, NBC. Um, they're actually licensing content, and some of the content that's up there won't be up there forever. It's probably licensed for a certain term mm -hmm. versus the average YouTuber will do what's called evergreen content because YouTube has a content ID mechanism that basically allows for the music rights to be cleared. 
whereas NBC, Comcast is probably, and this is my guess, hypothetical, yeah. having to pay for these music rights. And for somebody that didn't make the performance cut, maybe that's why it didn't appear on YouTube. And I'm going to throw this out to everyone, too. Um, cause this That was my guess as well. So um, I'm glad that you kind of like were kind of thinking the same. But for people just to understand, um, they do pull down episodes all the time. Like, so you think you can dance? You can't find season 13. They've now just moved on to season 14. But again, it's the same idea, music, licensing, things like that. So they it yeah. probably is it has a has a term limit I, I think the other thing that people have to understand is to get world of dance off the ground um this was a goliath event in terms of investment nbc so many people were involved in this the stakes were so high to make this show successful that these extras that you're asking for are things that we would like to give back to nbc mm -hmm. as feedback now that there's a season two but you got to understand just getting off the ground in season yeah. one was very very difficult so, I mean, people can nitpick, but maybe they don't understand. Uh, but hopefully that gives us an opportunity in season two to make some corrections. Well, and I think people need, if you're if you're kind of watching what's happening, first of all, you know, the show was announced, everyone was excited, the taping happened, and then I went to NBC's big um, summer press day, and I said to everyone, I've never seen a dance show have this big a presentation and have literally the press was le like tripping over themselves to talk to J-Lo, which of course it's J-Lo, but I'm like, this is a dance competition show. This isn't like Shades of Blue. The press is super excited. And I'm like, I think that's when NBC finally realized, like, oh my gosh, we've got something really big on their hands. And then when they matched it up with um, America's Got Talent, I'm like, they know what they're doing because that's their summer juggernaut show. Um, and it was the perfect lead in, I think. Yeah. I think you guys could probably be on your own. You know, you don't have to be on the same night as America's Got Talent now because you've established that identity. But I think that NBC set you guys up for success. Uh, you don't have to think that. That's that's what happened. Uh, NBC knows what they're doing. They understand their programming. They understand their audience. World of Dance is a perfect tale from uh, America's Got Talent. You know, the audience is similar. Um, the, the sort of format, in a sense, is similar. Competition, competition, um, great entertainment. Um, it was told from the beginning that if we were to get that coveted AGT post spot mm -hmm. that would help us and I'm sure that's part of the reason why we were successful yeah because it was interesting because originally they announced like there it's gonna be a few weeks like after Dancing with the Stars ends over here and then you shift over here and then it, it was a little confusing and then they just gave you one time slot and I was like this is a good move this is a really smart move um, and you know the other thing that I, I'm kind of encouraged by because I watched nappy tabs had you know they've been talking about uh, the judging and certain things because they've been hearing from the fans too because people love them and, and follow their work I'm encouraged that Everyone seems to be on the same page of like, we know. We know that we need more time. We know that we need to, you know, give people the opportunity to maybe be on the show instead of like, oh, you didn't air, sorry, you know, because you had too many contestants. Are you going to whittle down the contestants? Or is the categories going to maybe change that? I don't think we're going to whittle down contestants. I don't think that's the goal. I think the goal is to increase the time, airtime, yeah. which in a sense will allow for those contestants that didn't make it in season one to get the airtime that they deserve in season two. That's not a promise that everybody gets airtime because as you know- Welcome to TV. Or you can film a, a role, a film, and you won't get it. You know, they, they cut you on the cutting room floor. You just never know what happens. Exactly. I, I, think, I think what's important is we're offering an opportunity for dancers to display their craft as they see fit. All we ask is that they do the best that they can do. If that makes the cut, then that's great. And if they continue to make the cuts, then they're continuing to get that TV time, so to speak, to help build their brand. And the thing that I'm also proud of is at the end of the day, you can walk away with a million dollars. And I'm proof that when someday it's gonna be, you know, this group or that group that will win, it, it will be life changing. And if this ends up being a 10 series, 10 season run, I think we're gonna change lots of lives and there's gonna be a lot of amazing stories that are post world of dance. Oh, I kind of like that. You know, and, and this is the thing, like dancers in business, I always say it's oftentimes there it's like oil and water. So being able to sort of marry this together and get them to understand the business side of it more is really really helpful and it, if you make a million dollars, that really sets up their career. What advice do you have for, for dancers in creating a brand? Because I think a lot of people get lost and just think I'll start an Instagram page and like people will just come and follow or I'll do YouTube. It's you really have to sort of craft something. And I think that's where Ian Eastwood really is smart about it because he knows who he is as an artist, but he knows who he is as a businessman as well. Yeah. You know, 
advice is hard to give in in a sense of brand building. Uh, Ian has done uh, an exceptional job at building his brand at who he is. I would say another person that does, another group that does a really great job is Kinjas. Yes, um, they are excellent brand builders. Um, what I can say about building a brand and advice is there's more than one way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, some people believe that building a brand is in how you present the brand. So they're, they're caring after every detail of how it's outwardly perceiving them. So Ian and Kinjas, as an example, are very into their content, very into their perfection. Everything that they do represents their brand. And because of that, that's why we could all say without a doubt, oh yeah, these guys are really good. They know what they're doing. Right. Now, on the other hand, there are people that have incredible followings that maybe don't have that attention to detail. So how is it that one can be perfect in this sense and get a huge following, but someone on this side might just be all about content and putting it out there and so forth? And and I always say that, and I've, I've said this to all of my staff members at World of Dance, there are a lot of ways to drive around the world. You can drive around this way, you can drive around that way. <laughs> <Or> that way. <laughs> but the key, the key is to keep driving and know where you wanna go at the end, like know your destination. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know your route, but as an example, you know, Ian, Kinjas, those type of people that are building their brand in that way, they know that destination, that's why they're good at it. You know, another person may not know the destination, but it just has the drive to, be, to get where they wanna go. Yep. And ultimately, that's that's how they build their brand. It's giving them the inertia, which is kind of interesting. Um, what do you think, like five years from now, where do you see World of Dance? Because there is going to be, I just see the explosion of growth. Um, it's been really interesting seeing some of the stars pulled from the show um, out there at, you know, at some of the events as well. Mm -hmm. So where do you see this going? That's a good question. Um, I will say that we intend to do what no other dance property has done before. Um, there are some amazing dance properties. This is not to take away from anyone that's been successful through broadcast, but we're not looking at broadcast as our only means of success. That's one part of it. A live tour is a nice extension. Uh, the other thing that I think is important to understand is we're not creating token merchandise. We, we have a lifestyle behind World of Dance, which is very different than even you know American Idol or The Voice, things like that. There are people that wear our merchandise because they're proud of being in this dance culture. They're not wearing it purely from a brand perspective, like, oh, that's, uh, you know, I saw it on TV, so I'm gonna wear that brand. Um, they're really invested in the world of dance. And I think that community investment is gonna allow us to do things that are far different than what traditional broadcast shows have done in the past. So the, I guess, short answer to where I see the future, we will have a theatrical show. I also believe that the juniors, as we're doing juniors and junior teams, I think there's a huge marketplace in developing WAD juniors as its own sort of format. Mm. I'm imagining it similar to AYSO soccer, where it's taking place all over the place. Um, we will create a licensing model that'll allow people to leverage the World of Dance name, but also produce smaller competitions that aren't necessarily about the best because at the junior level, it's just about encouragement and it's about getting more and more people into And the this growth community. and everything. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, have you seen, because uh, all of a sudden, you know, you've got all eyeballs because of, you know, NBC's World of Dance, the people that have been there a long time, hardcore, has there been any backlash of just saying, oh, you sold out, oh, commercialization? Have you felt that at all? Because you do need to nurture those people as well. <laughs> yeah, now, I, I feel that all the time because I feel like I'm more from the community, even though I admit I'm not a dancer per se, I feel like I live within the heart of the community um, and I understand where people are coming from. Of course, there's what's called the truest uh, or, or you know true school yeah. um, sometimes there's people that are so firm on their idea of what things are that they're not as open to change um, with me I'm very open to change yeah. I think change is good change provides new direction and honestly dance has been around for a long time hundreds of years since the beginning of time <laughs> and you know we're saying why is it only now that you know the, the there's this inertia and energy taking place. I think it's taking place because people are accepting change. They may not accept it all, they may not understand it, but I think we need to embrace it and I think we need to help each other evolve and change and, and move this scene forward together. 
Oh, I love that because it's just, it's such a great community and I encourage people to get out there because you guys are all over the place. I know that if you go onto your website, there's a huge map of events that are happening all across the country. And I think that um, I, I was encouraged only because I went there and I was like, it's been a hot political climate out there in the United States. And I was like, you know what? I was able to drop in in Pomona for a few hours and like, forget all of that. Like everyone was here from all walks of life and, and because of what you've created uh, World of Dance, it was really kind of amazing. Well, you know, I, I would say thank you for acknowledging that, but I think it's also important to realize there were predecessors before World of Dance that are equally as successful, in fact, maybe more successful in some senses. You know, Body Rock, Vibe, uh, mm -hmm. Max Stout, there's, there's a lot of competitions that have done extremely well at yep. developing the Southern California scene. Um, we feel like what we've done differently than them is just broaden it uh, nationally and now internationally. Um, some of the quality level of what these other competitions are doing is amazing. It's mm -hmm. really next level. Um, we aspire to be like that in some cases. Um, in other cases, we're also trying to manage our own growth and expansion and so forth. Of course, we're going to get criticism that, you know, we're moving too fast, we're going too big, we're going too slow, Growing we're pains. not doing enough. We're going to have it. Yeah, but, but that's my point in embracing change. We've always embraced it. We've always changed with the times. We've taken our licks. We've had our improvements. And at the end of the day, we're here. We're trying to make a difference. Yep, and we're going to see that with season two. So I just want everyone to know, because a lot of people have had so many questions about that. So I'm like, let, we got to look forward towards season two. Um, will there be a live aspect to it at all? Do you any any thoughts on that? Uh, no confirmed thoughts. Uh, there is some visionary thoughts of huge arenas and a live finale. Um, that I like. That's visionary. Dolby Theater is always so, good. Yeah, that's always know. good. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, audience participation. I know the Snapchat, there was a Snapchat vote with that show, but any thought of audience voting? At a little bit of a popularity contest sometimes. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think that we want to leave it up to the audience. I think that's one of the things that's different about this show. <laughs> um, of course, the drawback to not having an audience vote is you get a lot of audience chatter. <laughs> but that's good. I, good and bad chatter is, you know, it fuels the show a lot too. Yeah, chatter is chatter. Yeah. But I, I do believe that the audience vote, um, in some shows that's an important aspect. In our show right now, we're relying on the judges to do the best they can do. Excellent. Well, um, one final question. What's your best dance move? My best dance move? If we, if we were going to uh, out the dance floor, what's your best dance move? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> that would be a tough one. I uh, won't make you do it, uh, but... <laughs> yeah, if, if I say this, I might lose all credibility in the dance scene, so... I know the next time they see you, they're going to say, we want to see it. But, <laughs> do it. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I might have a couple of moves, but nothing that's a favorite. It's going to leave that? it to weddings and parties <laughs> and <laughs> things like that. Well, I want to thank you for just sharing your thoughts. It's been really an incredible season, and it's been such a fun summer of dance, at least for me, just to be sort of entrenched in this whole world. So oh, thank you. You bet. All right. Where can everyone find information about World of Dance? Because you guys have several websites too. So yeah, we have um, worldofdance.com. We intend to make worldofdance.com the sort of central thing for all things dance. Right now it's focused on registration and things that are related um, to our core tour, but we want to bring casting in, juniors in, our theatrical shows in. That, that'll that ultimately be the worldofdance.com. But we also have a publication called This Is Wad. Um, it's an interesting publication because there's so much content, as you know, coming mm -hmm. out of television or even coming out of our international events that needs a home. So this is why it would be sort of the marriage between what's taking place in broadcast and what's taking place in Lithuania. So it's a different, you know, website, but again, it's all things world of dance. This is wad.com. Yeah, and this is what I love. This is what I read all the articles about the contestants and everything else. So get a lot of scoop. And are you on social media yourself or do you hide? Uh, I hide. I, I live vicariously through the world of dance social media. Perfect. Um, I, I do believe in, in influencer and influencer marketing. My style of influence is one to one. So mm -hmm. if you have uh, any questions or relationships, it's great to be broadcasted like this but I'm always available. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciate you coming by today here on To The Point. Thank you so much. Who's going to win? Ah, <laughs> I tried. All right, you guys, next week, I'm still working on it. We have someone, but we have to work out their filming schedule. So stay tuned on Twitter. I'll let you guys know who the guest is, but I promise you it is a good one. And uh, we want to thank you guys for joining us here at Popcorn Talk and Dance Network. Check out all of our articles on World of Dance on dancenetwork.tv. We will see you all next week.
from producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.